um, I would like to welcome you to the first Detroit Tech Watch and Collider Partnership of 2022. My name is Ryan Nico, and I am here representing Collider, which is a community hub for tech professionals who are leveling up their skills with digital business innovation. Um, and as usual, we're proud supporters of the Detroit Tech Watch, and we are here to help you level up your tech career. Um, so I will drop a link in the chat, and then you can check us out later when you have some time. Also, I will drop my email in the chat. So if you have any specific questions, do not hesitate to reach out. But Onario or Mike, please take it away. You want to take a mic or you want me to? <laughs> Why don't you go for it? Because you have a little bit more. You invited Marcus. Uh, also, I'll just quickly say, Marcus, welcome. Welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited about this. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay. So, uh, without belaboring the point too much, I saw Marcus down at Strange Loop last year, uh, and TLA Plus is something I've been very interested in for um, a couple of years now. And Marcus gave a great session, like a day-long tutorial on it. And I thought maybe I can get him just to give us a brief, brief intro. Uh, it's really an, a, a really neat tool and I don't want to steal any of his thunder, so I won't say anything more, but without any further ado, Marcus, take it away. Okay, sure. Yeah, well, hi everybody. Um, I happen to be an engineer working at Microsoft on TLA Plus for about a decade now, just to give you a rough idea on my uh, level of expertise, I would say. Uh, I work on the tools, but I also train uh, engineers at Microsoft and TLA Plus and generally tr just try to make it uh, usable and help more teams adopt it. Uh, in terms of today, uh, what I want to show you is kind of like an excerpt of, of what Onario mentioned. Um, first of all, I will give you the uh, uh, executive level summary introduction to TLA Plus with a handful of slides. Um, this is where you can lean back and just listen. Uh, but then once we get to number two here and three and four, uh, I need your help because I want to use TLA Plus to really debug uh, a deadlock in, a, in an existing system. And we will see uh, uh, kind of two cornerstones or core features of TLA Plus. Uh, yeah. Formalization of safety and liveness, deadlock, starvation. And then since this question pops up pretty much always, uh, I want to share a little bit of how to uh, connect your implementations to your TLA plus specifications before, you, before I give you the homework assignment to really design something novel with TLA plus, namely the termination for this multi-producer, multi-consumer queue. Um, but let's get started first. <clears throat> okay, so the, the 30,000 feet above uh, perspective on TLA Plus is, if you go to Wikipedia, it's a specification language to design, document, and verify reactive systems. Uh, so let's uh, unpack this from the back. So reactive systems are concurrent systems and distributed systems usually. So those that are exhibit a lot of non-determinism and uh, thus, pretty hard, at least compared to sequential um, algorithms. Um, sequential algorithms already are difficult, but reactive systems are even more difficult. Um, so here we need a strong tool support to get them right. Um, but what's more important is initially that TLA Plus is the specification language. So it's not a programming language and its goal is so that you design your system before it gets implemented and you document it. And that way, uh, yeah, don't, create a couple of bugs um, that you then would later implement, right? So it, it prevents you from implementing bugs. Um, it's creator, it's this person here, and this is not Photoshop. Uh, this is um, taken from his uh, recording, his um, tutorial introduction to TLA Plus. He's uh, yeah, better recognized um, by this picture here. He's Leslie Lamport, a Turing Award winner of 2013. So he made similar contributions to computer science. Um, in the area of reactive systems. And you can kind of see TLA plus as uh, the tool that he wish, wished he would had at the beginning of his career when he worked on, on Paxos and the bakery algorithms and all those difficult uh, reactive systems. Um, and what 
he really wants to stress now what, was I, what I have to stress is that TLA plus once again is not programming. The idea here is it create a new artifact in the software development process that's in between our pros documentation and our implementation. Just recently, I uh, was presented a pros document about 60 lines or so of Word in a Word doc. I translated it in, into 600 lines of TLA plus approximately. Um, I think once this gets implemented, it's perhaps 6,000, 60,000, 600,000 lines of code. Now, uh, without TLA plus, there's this huge disconnect between the pros and the actual implementation. If we really want to understand something, um, the, the pros document doesn't have enough semantics and the implementation, it's just too much detail. And TLA plus tries to be kind of in the middle ground here. And this is the fundamental idea. We have a new artifact, another truth uh, in the, the software development lifecycle. And also, uh, we, we don't sell snake oil here. Um, it doesn't free you from, um, from thinking. Right? It's not a tool where you uh, insert your program code and then you get a yes and no answer out that says correct, incorrect. Quite to the contrary, it's actually just a, a thinking aid that helps you to be more powerful and to catch your thinking mistakes. But it doesn't free you from thinking. Okay. The perhaps most prominent uh, yeah, application of TLA Plus was written about in 2013, 2014, uh, when a group of Amazon AWS engineers um, designed systems such as DynamoDB or S3, and I don't know, a few others. Um, and for those that don't know, DynamoDB is this planetary scale, uh, NoSQL uh, database. So replication, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong, right, when you operate this system. So you have to account for all of these uh, failure cases. Um, and the initial design they wrote, um, they used whiteboard designs, design discussions, uh, handwritten proofs to convince themselves, okay, this can work. And then they uh, wrote a prototype, right? This is what the usual software development process looks like. Sketch a design, implement it, test the hell out of it, and then rinse and repeat. And then later in production, you learn that you didn't catch all the corner cases. Um, so they were kind of yeah, probably smart and looked at various formal methods. Um, they happened to like TLA plus best, and they wrote a TLA plus specification for DynamoDB. And this, this logic checker TLC, this tool that, that comes with TLA plus, um, even after this, pros, uh, um, this design was prototyped and tested, still found a bug. And this bug manifested after 35 steps. Um, in an implementation, it probably translates into way more steps, uh, but at a high level spec, uh, at the high level spec level, it, it will, uh, those were 35 steps. Um, I think humans usually can handle like seven to nine variables, right? So 35 steps is pretty difficult to reason through without getting lost. Um, they were pretty happy with it. Uh, long story short, they wrote in the CACM paper here, using TLA plus in place of traditional software, proof writing would thus likely have improved time to market in addition to achieving greater confidence in the system's correctness. And if you want, you can read the paper and there's plenty of um, detail in there, um, but it got strong support and adoption in, inside of uh, Amazon, which is funny because TLA plus is a Microsoft uh, research project. So we're kind of competitors uh, if you think that way. Okay, so this is obviously way too big to look into uh, within one hour or so. So I have a slightly simpler problem. Let's just pretend uh, our production had an outage a couple of days ago, something went wrong. Uh, somebody came in to save the day by turning it off and on again, right? Um, but now we're kind of tasked to do the post-mortem. And by looking at log files and sifting through all the uh, information we can get, uh, we found that there is a deadlock. Um, and a deadlock in a multi-producer, multi-consumer queue. So we have a set of uh, producers. Here in this picture, we have four. We have three consumers. The producers add element into this buffer, which happens to be three elements large. Uh, but for some reason, the buffer was full, yet all threads were blocked. 
right? This shouldn't happen, classical bad luck. Uh, how can that be? Okay, and now comes the part where I need your help to figure out what went wrong. So here is kind of the, the, the C code uh, that we found in our system. Um, we initialize the buffer, okay? It's statically initialized to a fixed size. It doesn't grow, it doesn't shrink. It's just gets initialized to so and so many elements. In the picture, it was three. Then we have uh, like four producers. So we spawn four producer threads. And we have three uh, consumer threads. So we spawn three consumer threads. And they execute the producer and the consumer function, okay? So let's move up there. So producer, straightforward, there's a while loop and uh, non-terminating while loop. We acquire a mutex, so lock, we get hold of the lock, the, the producer who's currently executing. If the producer finds that the buffer is full, okay, that can happen, right? Um, it waits. And this is the only thing it can do, right? It waits on this um, modify condition. And it keeps waiting until the point that somebody else sends a signal. So the producer resumes again. It finds that the buffer is no longer full. It adds an element to the buffer. It in turn signals somebody else and it unlocks the mutex. And the consumer kind of does the inverse, except that it uh, checks the buffer to if it's empty or not, right? If it's empty, it waits again. Otherwise, it removes the head element it signals and it unlocks. And we don't even care where this element goes that it removes from the buffer because we're just interested in the deadlock. Okay, so in other words, there's no real interleaving here, right? So whenever somebody is a producer holds the producer of the mutex here, there are no consumers actively executing. And likewise, there are no consumers executing when there is a, is a producer inside of uh, inside of this critical section here, appending an element to the set, to the buffer. Okay, so does anybody know, care to venture a guess of what the problem is? How can this thing possibly deadlock? Well, I guess we do what we always do when we, when we try to reproduce a bug. You write a test I'm sorry. Script, right? I was trying to unmute my audio. <laughs> okay. Did, did I manage? <laughs> yep, Anybody no, else cares to unmute their audio and take a stab at it? Let's not leave. Let's not leave Marcus hanging. <laughs> yep. Yep. Or if you're shy, put it in the chat. Perhaps we're paying attention. Well, I have this test case for you here, so I get you covered. Uh, the only thing okay. I need from you is. What, what should I enter here in terms of buffer size, producers, and consumers? Do you want me to get started with, I don't know, a buffer of 124, 512 consumers, 512 producers? Or do you rather want me to do one buffer of size one, one producer, one consumer? What do you want? Ballpark number here. Uh, I don't know. Let's start with 10, 10, and 10. 10, 10, and 10. Okay. 10. 10 and 10, that's, that's, yeah, okay, perhaps. You think maybe larger? No, no, it's fine. See, it's running. So now we wait, okay? Let's see if this deadlocks. And let me just quickly check that I didn't accidentally run the, the correct version. No, nope, it's the broken version. Otherwise it wouldn't be fair, right? So while this <laughs> is running, and hopefully uh, eventually exhibiting the deadlock. Let's move over here and to look at the TLA plus specification. I will make this smaller. So here on the right, we now have our C program and I will explain to you how this translates into a TLA plus spec. Okay, it looks a little bit more different. Uh, it looks different to, to program code because TLA plus is actually logic. Um, so it looks more mathy, less like C or um, an imperative programming language, but fundamentally it all describes computations. Um, my takes I'm getting used to, um, might even scare you away um, because perhaps you didn't like math in school, um, but it's really not that difficult. Don't get scared away, it's easy. I don't hold an advanced degree, yet I managed to understand this stuff. 
Okay, we get started at the bottom here, translating this back into C. So what, what happens here in the in and next is that initially we say, okay, the buffer is empty. This is just syntax here that says the buffer is empty. It's an empty sequence. And this weight set variable here also is initially empty. This one is a set, so it doesn't have order, doesn't have duplicates, and this one is a sequence, so it has duplicates in order. And then we say throughout the computation of the system, we pick a, a thread that's not blocked, meaning it's not part of this weight set here. And if the one that we pick is a producer, well, then it produces something. If it's a consumer, it consumes something. Producer and consumers are just two constants here, producer, consumer, that don't change. It's right? just a set of, of elements, of threads. And please interrupt me if you could have questions. Okay, so now let's come get to the interesting part. What does put or can producer translate to? It translates to put. This is an or here. So this symbol is an or. So we have either this or this. If the buffer is not full, well, then append the element to the buffer, notify. If the buffer is full, wait. Straightforward. There's a question, Larry. Is the screen working fine for everybody? Actually, uh, I'm seeing the blur that they were seeing as well. I was just about to post in there and noticed some other people were posting in there. Yeah. Can you make it even larger blurry. if that works? Yeah, I don't even know if it's that. It seems like uh, video quality because you, you, even you are a little pixelated, which makes the you know the code far more pixelated. So it's it's really hard to read at this moment. Okay. Um, well, if it doesn't improve, I have could try to share the screen. That helps. Yeah, that 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 might be helpful, or or like um, you know like. On share, share some something. Um, and I mean, it's not showing us. I'm not seeing any network issue on my end, but I mean, I'm not sure if you're seeing an issue on your end. Uh, is this there you go. Things better? Much clearer. Oh okay. yeah, there it is. Back, back to Much normal. Much clearer. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect again. Okay. Yep. Cool. Then let yeah, me I pretend. just yeah. Okay. Uh, let's click, click quickly recap here what this put does. So it says uh, a producer is allowed to add an element to the buffer if the buffer is not full and to notify somebody else. And if the buffer is full, it has to wait. Okay, so it's kind of straightforward to what we've seen over here in the C code. And the buffer, uh, sorry, the consumer again is if the buffer is empty, it's not empty, this is not equals the empty sequence then remove an element and notify. And if it's empty, then wait. Okay, it's essentially equivalent to the C program. Just formulated as a mathematical formula. And then I said, okay, TLA class is not a programming language. So we don't have, uh, what is it? P thread condition signal and P thread condition mutex weight, yada, yada, yada. We have to specify this ourselves. And uh, just to give you an idea, um, so in, let's see, where is it? So this here is the implementation of P thread condition signal. Okay, so about, I don't know, 200 lines of code plus the broadcast, plus the, uh, the system level calls, such as where are the piecing CD broad and so on and so on. So this alone, I think probably warrants a specification by itself. In the high level TLA plus part, we can specify it like this, right? So we have a weight. Well, weight means we add this thread, the T here to the weight set, okay? and Notify us, well, if there is somebody, if the weight set is not empty, then pick one and remove it from the weight set. Okay, it's essentially just removing and adding an element to a set. Pretty straightforward. Obviously in implementation, it's way more difficult because you have to think about all these synchronization issues, but here in TLA plus an action is always atomic. So this here is atomic, this is atomic. There are no interleavings. 
this is just taken care of for us. Okay. So nice. By the way, this one still hasn't hasn't exhibited the, the deadlock yet. Okay, let's keep it running and see what we can do with this one here. Unless there are questions, please interrupt me if you have questions. PQ. So I will check this one now with our TLC checker that the Amazon people liked. And it says, okay, I found four states. It found four states in the case that there are uh, blocking queues here. A buffer of size one, one producer, and one consumer. So the minimal possible configuration. Let's look at this uh, state graph. Make this bigger. Okay, I hope you can see it. So we start in this gray state. Uh, the buffer is empty, the weight set is empty. We can do a get operation when that on an empty buffer causes the weight set uh, to be to contain C1, right? So the consumer has to wait if it tries to get something from the empty buffer. From here, a producer can add an element to the buffer and then I'm removing the C from the weight set. From here, we can go to this state where uh, the producer tries to produce again. This time it fails because the buffer is full. So the producer gets into the weight set and we go back from here by consuming, by getting an element again, which makes the buffer empty and the weight set, weight set empty. And we can just transition along the, the arcs here in this graph, right? Back and forth. And surprisingly, there is no deadlock. Okay, there is yeah, no state. Yeah, deadlock there, no. Yeah, there's no deadlock. That's strange. That's interesting. Okay, let's let's try something else. Let's try a different configuration. Let's try and increase the buffer to two. Check model with TLC, blah, blah, blah. Takes no time. Opening this is always a little bit painful. So we get one extra state, but again, there is no deadlock, right? So there's no state when, where the weight set contains both, both threads. So I go to the next configuration, two threads, two producers, one consumer buffer of size one. And this one, yeah, it's done. Let me open this again. Ooh, it's way bigger. And I have to make it larger, larger for you. And see, now suddenly there is a state where there's uh, where all three threads are on the weight set. Okay. Ah. So oh, there is this is nasty, right? So apparently there are configurations where this thing deadlocks, and there are configurations where it doesn't deadlock. So if you just happen to choose the wrong configuration here in your unit test, you can wait forever. And now imagine a situation where you auto scale or something on, in the cloud, right? And so far for the last half year or so, it, it for some reason stayed under this threshold where deadlocks, and then suddenly it goes over the deadlock, uh, over the threshold, right? So that makes it really difficult to, to spot. Um, Interesting. So let's let's try and reproduce this here. So I will instrument this code here, this the C code with tracing information. And now I think if we run it with one to one, that's the same configuration as in the other one here. It also deadlocks. Ooh, okay, this takes a thing, looks like eight states or so, eight steps. Second time eight. Most of the time it's eight steps, but now it's more. So it's, there's some non-determinism in here. I think I've seen it go up to 20 states or so based on timing, but most of the time it, we seem to be lucky here and hit the shortest, shortest trace. But remember there are also Heisenberg bugs, right? That disappear once you start using tracing because maybe uh, it interferes with the synchronization that's going on on STD out and STDR. Uh, so luckily this one isn't a Heisenberg. But if we, for example, try the configuration 111, this runs forever. And I guess with 10, 10, 10, I think it should deadlock. But 
where do you start reading this, this stress information? Do you start at the beginning? Oh, and then you're probably staring at millions of lines of trace information, or do you just start at the end and try to reason over your way backwards? That's difficult, right? Um, yeah. So here in this one, so far we've only seen uh, a graph. And if I go to buffer 10, 10 producers, 10 consumers, believe me, this, this graph becomes a spaghetti ball. It doesn't render even uh, because <laughs> it gets so big. Um, but there's something better. We don't want to look at graphs. Instead, I would just say, okay, we, don't, we want the specification to not deadlock. And that's the case if the weight set is not equal to the union of the producers and the consumers. Okay, for as long as the weight set is not equivalent to the producers and the consumers, there is no deadlock. If this one gets is false, then there is then there is a violation, then there is a deadlock. Okay, makes sense. So let's add this here. Marcus, uh, yeah, cop. Yep. What's going on? Uh, cop. You use that slash cop. Oh, cop. Yeah. Okay. So this is a that, union. That's union of sets then. Right, that combines the producers and consumers into, into one. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Okay, so this is one set here and this one is another set. Could have made it more clear and put parentheses here. Um, but really just that combines two sets. Okay, we don't need this graph here anymore, I think, okay. Let's check this once again. Don't need this stuff anymore. And ta-da, here we get, no longer get success. We now get an error, 21 states. Our invariant no deadlock is violated. And here we see the nine states it takes to uh, run into, into the deadlock. So I can rerun this. Okay, same nine states again. And this is deterministically gives us the same same error trace. I can also change the configuration. I won't go to 10, 10, 10, but let me go to, I believe three, P3, P4, C2, C3 here. Ah, let's turn this into C and check this. So now some 10,000 states and the error trace is already 47 states long. So apparently the error trace gets longer the more processes are in the system. That's also strange, right? So if you try and do this with your configuration of 10, 10, 10, I don't know, I don't know the formula uh, that gives you the length of the error trace, but it would probably be in the thousands or so, if not even longer. <laughs> you know, I just gotta ask Marcus, is this a situation where if they're the same, it's one, 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 or five, 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 or 10, 10, 10, you won't run into a deadlock, but if they're different, you will, or is it just a coincidence? Uh, I can reveal it later, um, what, the, what the formula is. I mean, what we would probably do here, and the way how I figured it out is, I just reran it for a couple of configurations, and then I, uh, I, I charted it, plotted it, right? And then I could see it okay. in, a, in a two dimensional chart where the area where the deadlocks are. So essentially it's, if the buffer, um, is two times the buffer size is equal to the cardinality of both of the union of both sets, producers and consumers. Then you have the deadlock. If the buffer is too big, there is no deadlock. Uh, there is a deadlock. If the buffer is too small, there is no deadlock. Okay. 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 <clears throat> so it's it's strange, but let's let's really drill into this and understand it. Um, in most cases, when you work with TLA plus, you will look at this trace. Okay, not at this one because this one is too long. What you always try to do is to find the shortest possible, the minimal configuration that reproduces the bug. And if you take anything out of today's talk here, it should be that if you test something, start with the minimum first, even with testing. Don't go for 10, 10, 10, go for 1, 1, 1. If that doesn't work, 1, 2, 1 or 2, 1, 1. Uh, and gradually increase, and systematically especially increase. So this one has nine steps, okay? That seems to be in the area of what a human can, can reason about. 
most of the time when you work with TLA plus, we would look at this, study it, think about it. I said, it's a thinking tool, right? So this is what you have to reason through now. Um, because this is a presentation, I can, let me, can I stop this here? Yeah. Let me just uh, advance my material here. And by the way, you find all of this material um, on the internet on GitHub. Let's see, I have to go to the animation. Here we are. Because I created an animation with which it's easier to understand the deadlock. Okay, let's ah, except there is a bug in this PDF viewer, so I have to open it again. Okay, so now so now we have nine slides that represent this deadlock here. Just uh, more nicely uh, rendered. So we have our buffer here, it's currently empty. We have our two producers, P2, P1, and our consumer over here. P2 is currently active, so it's executing. And in the next state, it's going to add this N element into the buffer. P1 and C1, they are both enabled, so they can, can run, they're not blocked, but the scheduler hasn't scheduled them yet. So P1 adds the element to the buffer. Okay, the buffer is full. P2 uh, yeah, keeps control and tries to add another element to the buffer. Obviously this fails, right? So P2 gets blocked. Our scheduler, the system scheduler decides to make P1 the active threat. So it gets control. What it tries, it tries to add an element to the buffer. This fails, it also gets blocked. But that's fine, right? Because now it, it's the, the time for the consumer to remove the element from the buffer. Okay, it takes the N out of the buffer, immediately again tries to retrieve another element. There is none, so it gets blocked. But since something happened to the buffer, P2 got active again. And now P2 adds an element to the buffer and it notifies P1. It tries to add an element again, it fails. And now P1 is the only active element, active uh, threat. It itself cannot add anything to the buffer and here's your deadlock. So here, the, really the moment here is where the deadlock actually happens. So it doesn't happen in the last state. It happens in this state because it adds an element, P2 adds an element to the buffer and it notifies P1, right? And in this case, this is wrong. There are cases where this is fine, right? At the beginning, it's fine to notify P1, right? Um, but in other cases, it's, uh, it, it subsequent, subsequently leads to a deadlock. Okay, so what could be the fix? Um. You get, somehow would have to make the uh, make adding to the queue atomic. Well, I think. So it, that's actually atomic. Um, ah, okay, look at this sorry. trace again. <laughs> so this part, this step is atomic, right? So we atomically add the the element to the to the to the buffer and send the signal to to one of the waiting threads. Um, the problem is with the notification. So if you happen to know the API of p thread uh, condition wait, p thread condition signal, there is a p thread condition broadcast. Okay, so the difference between signal and broadcast is that. Signal sends a notification to one thread, uh, one waiter, and broadcast sends a signal to all waiters. Okay, so in other words, we do something not like a notify, but a notify all. Let's see if that fixes our specification. So instead, oh, I have the notify all here already because I moved ahead in the, in the Git repository, the Git commits. So this is now the new definition of notify all. Instead of picking an element from the wait set, we now just remove all the elements from the wait set. 
Okay, and this is then uh, equivalent to sending a signal to all of them. So let's see. Yeah, that seems to fix the deadlock. Nice. So fewer states, it, that's fine, but the deadlock is gone, right? Now, whenever we signal, if we, whenever something happens with the buffer, we send the signal to all waiters, not just to one waiter, but to all of them. Do you think this is elegant? So what happens is the consumer starts blocking and because the consumer is blocked, the producer puts one in there and then the producer gets blocked and the next producer is already blocked. So they're all three blocked. So by sending a signal to all three of them, then the consumer says, oh, I know there's something there waiting for me. Now I can pull it so it doesn't, it doesn't block. Am I following right. you right? So in, in, this, in this step here, step number six, when P2, yeah. so P1 and C1 are both blocked. Now right. P2 adds an element to the buffer. And right. previously with notify, it only sends a signal to P1. With notify all, it sends a signal to P1 and C1, and both would become yellow again, or both become yellow again. Okay, and then it doesn't matter if this one P1 gets scheduled, finds that it's uh, that the buffer is full and becomes blocked again, because it would still have C1 to actually remove right. the Right, okay. Element. Yeah, so yeah, basically you need to not yeah, notify C1 as well to make sure that C1 knows there's something or it can check there's something to consume. Exactly, right. Okay, and that makes sense. This works, okay? Unsurprisingly, this works. Pretty straightforward reason. But now the question is, do you like the solution? So let's imagine we run this, really run this with... Uh, a buffer of 124, 10,000 producers and 20,000 consumers in the cloud setting or something. And what happens if the buffer is full? Well, then I guess a large number of these threads will block, right? And then what happens if we remove an element, we signal all of them. That's not great. I, I try to quantify this, what the, what the overhead is of Doing this this broadcast again uh, instead of the of this of the single signal, uh, the notify all compared to the notify, uh, but it seems difficult to, to really quantify without running elaborate uh, performance tests. But obviously, it's there's more overhead when you send a signal to n uh, threads, n waiters compared to just sending a signal to one of them. At least that's what I would expect. I don't know with modern hard architectures, sometimes intuition doesn't really work. At any rate, I don't like the solution from the algorithmic perspective, right? Because what, what is it that we really have to do? Do we really have to send a notify to all waiters? In this, uh, in this, at this point, where should we better send the signal? Should we send it to P1 and C1? I was thinking oh, to send it to consumers, of, right? Yeah, I was just going to say right. send it to consumers or a set of consumers. Yeah, kind of like a, a ping pong type thing. Exactly, right? That would be way more elegant instead of using this kind of shotgun approach where you just randomly shoot at a group of things and hope to hit the right one. Why not actually be smart about it and really just notify the other type, right? If we notify, if, if it's a producer that adds an element to the buffer, uh, well, then by thinking this through, you know that the only element that can act on this is a consumer, right? So there is no point really to, to uh, notify another producer. Well, at least it seems. Maybe it causes another bug, but let's find out. So let's, let's define notify other. There is, by the way, no notify other in, in P thread condition. There is only broadcast and signal. Uh, but here we are free to do whatever we like, right? So. I would say this takes, takes an, a, 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 some other. And then I say that if the weight set uh, with the other, other is non-empty, non well then there exists a T in, copy paste this stuff here. And I will, once I'm done typing, I will explain what's going on here, okay? Weight set prime minus t 
else weight set prime equals weight set. Okay, so here the put notify all gets rewritten to notify consumers. And this one gets written to notify other producers. So when the consumer does a notify other, it notifies producers. So here we get the set of producers. We take the intersection, that's the cap um, of the weight set and the producers. So it only leaves the producers in the weight set if there are any, meaning this is non-empty, or then we pick one of them. And in other words, we could say that in this case, it's a, it's a type P here, right? And then conversely, notify other for producer ads and a consumer. And now we really get, uh, I guess, a typo somewhere. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Wait, set right, I think. It's up here. This has to be this. And this also works. Okay, for some reason, and this has nothing to do with performance, this has more states. You can kind of think about this this way that if you just individually notify threads, then there are more, more possible combinations that you can notify threads, right? Compared to when you always notify all of them. So this is why we have more distinct states, but it doesn't mean that it's slower. There's no translation of this into, into actual performance. Um, but yeah, so this one also works. And I think we all kind of have the intuition that this is at least the more elegant solution. When we have a producer, it notifies a consumer. And if it's a consumer, it notifies a producer. But both solutions fix the, uh, fix the deadlock. That's nice. So everybody happy so far? I don't, let's see, where is it? Uh, let's move this one here. Okay, so we could probably chip this now and send it to, to production. We would have to figure out how to implement this here, right? Um, because as I said, there is no notify other. Let me show you how it's done. Uh, well, I guess I can just. Okay, so this should be. So the trick is. It should have been updated. I guess ah, I see. Uh, bum, bum, bum. So we have to look at the implementation of of the of the same data structure in Java. Okay, it's called array blocking queue in Java, but it's the same algorithm that's implemented in Java. The correct version that's implemented. And the way to implement it is you have a lock. Well, we previously also had a lock, right? The mutex. But instead of just one condition we have two conditions, we need two conditions. It's like having two weight sets, okay? We have a condition that says not empty and we have a condition not full. The producer notifies on one condition and the consumers wait on this one. And conversely, the consumers notify on the other, notify on the other condition and the producers wait on that one. So you have this kind of over cross um, uh, relationship here between the two conditionals and the producers and the consumers. So and from here, everything else is pretty much the same like in, in our specification, except there's way more detail here in the implementation of the array blocking queue of Java. Okay, so this would, would work. Does anybody see problems? Would you, would you now? I don't know if I understand it well enough to see problems in it, Marcus, but. <laughs> then, then, then ask questions. We're happy to answer questions. So do you think there's still a deadlock? Uh, I mean, we can check it. Just if, if there's a configuration that you want to have checked, just shoot. If they get too large, it will take too long, but um, I'm happy to check a different configuration if you want to, but I will- Well, I what if we do it with one, two, one, one, two, one again? One, two, one, sure. One, Since that two, blocks the one time, maybe it's worth trying again. No, oh, sure. This is it. Check model with TLC. Fine. And okay. I guess I could also show you how to do this for various configurations and then check all of them at once. 
or do this from a from a bash script, right? Um, right. But no, I, I promise you that there is no configuration where this deadlocks. This is deadlock free. As a matter of fact, let me uh, do a quick detour here. Uh, I have to advance my material a little bit. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay. So I even have proof that this is deadlock free. Uh, where is it? So TLA plus not only has a model checker and is a language to describe the system, it also has a proof system and a proof language where here I write, write, wrote the proof that the specification is deadlock free. I can run the proof system now on this one and it will verify that the reasoning is correct for any number of threads and buffer size. So there is machine check proof that this one is deadlock free. That's usually too much work to write this proof. So as most engineers don't, don't, don't spend the time on proving this stuff, but in this particular case, we have proof. Uh, let's see, TLAPM blocking queue, oh, no, wrong file. Blocking queue dot TLA, ah, dot TLA. Takes a couple of seconds, but oh, it went through. It doesn't complain about the file. So that means it got proved. So that's not it. In other words, the proof, what it gives us, there are no safety issues with this uh, specification. And yeah, don't, don't uh, try and read this proof here. That takes more time, right? Um, just wanted to, to mention that there is a proof system available. But yeah, so this. Uh, um, I think I see what you're getting is, at, Marcus. <laughs> is, is deadlock free? It's, it satisfies its safety properties. But um, I guess what could happen if we run this in production long enough that for some reason just some of our customers are unhappy. Okay, most of them are. Most of the time, it's fine. But every once in a while, one customer doesn't get served, or a subset of the customers don't get served um, because it seems it might be that there's some sort of starvation going on here. Okay, so what we really want to make sure is, for example, that for all producers and producers, um, and now we have to read, the, see the temporal uh, part. Marcus, sorry to stop you, man, time. you got a typo there. Yep. Uh, for all producers. producers. Or brought broad producers. Oh, yeah, thanks. No C yeah. in there. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, put P, comma, P. There's also uh, Vars here. So that should be it. So what, what this formula now here mandates is that repeatedly, this is what can be read as repeatedly, Again, I don't have time to really introduce the, the TLA plus syntax here, but you can just read it as repeatedly, every producer executes a put operation. Okay, it adds an element to the buffer. Okay, let's see if that one, if that one works. Uh, starvation, and let's add it to the config file, property, starvation and I believe I oh have to go back to the config file this okay let me just before I do this manually there's too much for me to ch change here uh, I will just fast forward am I fast forwarding da, 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 da. let's see type in Oh, a few more commits. This is a little bit, uh, it's too large to actually see what's going on. Um, there's the starvation part. Is it done in split? Let's see, let me quickly check it here, nope. Okay, starvation, life is checking, okay. Here we are now, there should be, let me make this smaller so I can see more of what's going on here. 
Ah, you right. could uh, here it is. Here click it is. on the editor and it'll give you a little more space. It'll take that column way on the left. Yeah, no, that's fine, I think. Uh, okay. So here it is. Here's the line I just typed, okay? Make it bigger again. It was just a, um, added below the, below the proof and I was looking for it above the proof. It should be in the config file. Yep, property starvation. And now let's see if this one checks out. And again, the model checker within very little time shows an error here. That this time, instead of being a sequence that added, uh, ended in a terminal state, now has this funny state that says back to state. So in other words, we have kind of a loop in here. Well, if you read this through, you will see that there is a threat here, a producer that never produces an element because it's, it's always waiting and never really adding an element to the queue, which is, I guess, not really surprising because there's nothing in here in our specification that says um, uh, that this should happen. Okay, and the difference now here between the previous problem we saw, which was a safety violation, this one is a so-called liveness violation. So where a good thing never happens. Okay, and this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, features of TLA plus that you don't usually find in other formalisms that it has first class support for both safety and liveness. Most formalisms let you check safety properties, nothing bad ever happens but they don't let you check the good thing that eventually happens. Um, here in TLA plus, this is first class and can happen. Okay, a question about, about liveness or safety, stuff like that. The way, what's the way here to make this now satisfy its liveness property? What do you think? Seems like you'd round think about robin it. the uh, producers you know, force it to, you know, force it to take turns producing. Okay, yeah, right. So what would be a good way to, to make them take turns? <laughs> Wish I knew. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. It's fair right here. So there's a specification, I've written this specification. It's almost the same specification. Here's your put, here's your get, in it, next. There, there are two differences to what we've seen before. First, now there are these two weights, uh, two, two uh, variables for the waiters, for the consumers and the producers, okay? That's what I said earlier, right? We need this, um, two conditions. Um, but now instead of it being a set, this is now a sequence. Okay, so now we have an order. When we add an element, we can have a, a LIFO, a FIFO order, whatever we want. Obviously we want to have a LIFO order here. So when we notify a threat, we use the head element, right? And that way we have this guarantee, guarantee um, that we get some sort of fairness here. And again, if we, were, if we would go and, and uh, look, let's see, uh, maybe I can find it. So this, this array blocking queue here, when it gets instantiated with the constructor, it has, it has this Boolean here, fair. And this Boolean is actually, uh, let's compare it, this is the default that tells the re-entrant lock whether or not it should maintain order or not. Okay, there's way more detail again here because this is programming, but this is exactly how it works with the reentrant lock. When it's non-fair, it just uses an unordered uh, set of things. And if it's fair, it uses an ordered um, uh, sequence. Obviously that's more expensive to maintain the order than just to keep uh, elements unordered. But this is the way how, how it's done. Okay. Um, so now- I'm sorry, Marcus, can yeah. I check something here? Sets oh. are all unique, but they're not necessarily ordered sequences. 
our order, right? You lost audio. You you lost audio on Oreo. But yeah, sets no order, no duplicates, sequences, order, thus duplicates. Okay. Anybody else here that can still hear me? Yep, I can still hear you. He did lose audio. I, I just, I stopped hearing him by the time you said it. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, I guess this kind of concludes the part about TLA plus. Uh, so there's time for questions. Uh, I have a, just a, a quick one. So are you just running that in VS Code and with terminal commands or are there is there like a standard set of scripts that you would use or, or tools? Um, <clears throat> so I kind of, so there is a full blown IDE based on Eclipse that right. I think is uh, perhaps in 2022 not sexy anymore but mm -hmm. which is provides the best first user experience and has the most guidance okay. uh, i would suggest starting with this one with the vs code extension uh, it's more bare bone it's more lightweight has fewer features uh, less guidance uh, so download the tla plus toolbox that also comes with a bunch of uh, uh, examples, beginner examples, um, and Lamport's video course, from which I stole the screenshot with the clown nose, um, that also introduces the TLA plus toolbox and is built on the TLA plus toolbox. Excellent. That answers my question. Thank you. Other questions? Hi. Uh, Hi. I have a question. Uh, uh, as, far, uh, as far as I know, um, TLC model checker itself has deadlock checking, right? So uh, uh, I'm just curious why uh, we used environment instead of deadlock checking. Oh, right. So uh, let me just rephrase the question. So here we, I stated this invariant, right? Uh, where was it? Uh, I think earlier it was called no deadlock. Whoop. This was called no deadlock. Now it's called invariant. Um, and TLC happens to have a flag. Let's check it here. If I remove this deadlock checking, then it, we wouldn't have to state this. Uh, or there's no deadlock anymore, so it doesn't find a deadlock. But there's built-in support in TLC for for deadlock specifically. Um, the reason why I didn't use it is it looks more magical. And it also only works for, for deadlocks and doesn't work for arbitrary safety violations. Um, whereas this is really the, the technique to state arbitrary safety violations. I hope that answers the question. I see, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I got it. More questions? Hey, Marcus, Dan here. Just a, yeah. a, a, I guess, shout out quick. Thanks. This is awesome intro. I think you gave us kind of a good uh, how and, and what, uh, but I guess I'm curious a little bit of like from your experiences, when do you tend to, to use TLA? Like is, to me, it feels like it's somewhere in the middle, right? It's not like test first, you know, testing where you're doing it ahead. It's not necessarily when the problems are there. I guess just kind of thinking through that, what's your your thoughts on? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so the short answer is that I've never written a spec that afterwards I thought, okay, this was a waste of time. This has never happened to me. Whenever I've written a spec, it kind of paid off. There were multiple occasions where I didn't wrote a spec because I thought, okay, this is easy. And then in hindsight, I thought, ah, dang, I should have written a specification. Um, but that's just my personal observation. I think more generally, there is obviously, uh, I wouldn't say overhead, but there is a cost of writing specifications that usually you get some return on later because you don't run into issues. Um, 
For, to give you an example, I once wrote for, for the TLC model checker itself, I wrote a weight free hash set that has some parts of it in memory, the other parts on disk. Uh, and again, this is all weight free, so there is no locking whatsoever. Um, this is notoriously difficult to get right. So I wrote the specification. I was interested in performance, so I also wrote a couple of prototypes. So I used kind of an iterative process. And once I was done, was happy with the performance, was happy with the correctness because the model checker gave the green light. I wrote the final implementation. And once I shipped it, I've never gone back and changed a thing in this piece of code. Um, there was no bug, right? And then it was just me, a single person writing the specification and the implementation um, for something that's yeah, notoriously difficult to get right. Um, another example is if you if you think of any other engineering discipline, I, I know it's it's kind of old to talk about about uh, building skyscrapers, but when you build a skyscraper, you don't start out with laying out the uh, foundation and then somebody else starts building the interior. No, everybody starts building more models and models and models on top of models before everybody is kind of happy that this is good enough. Um, and then the real work starts. Um, and I think software engineering is not there yet, um, which is, I think, and until I pass is one way to fill this gap. Um, if you look at the, no more, like more hands on, look at the, where is it here? Uh, the set of examples. We have this examples um, repository on GitHub. There are 85 examples. Um, you will find, quite a few for textbooks, textbook algorithms, for example, or more specifically, Raft and Paxos to consensus algorithms, which both have been kind of designed with TLA plus. Uh, other textbook algorithms, um, bakery algorithm and so on. But for example, also here, uh, the specification of, the, of how this thing called level checking works in TLC or of the TLC model checker itself, or more technically, uh, I can point you to, uh, where is it? To this, this beautiful blog post here, using TLA plus in the real world to understand the glibc bug. That's related to this uh, broadcast and signal that I, that I talked about earlier. And here uh, the author uses it to really uh, yeah, reproduce um, a real world issue in this library. There are a few more for, for Python code, issues in Python code, and then also other distributed systems like uh, the implementation of Raft in MongoDB and so on and so on. Um, there's a fair number of specifications that are perhaps a little bit more, uh, I would say, enterprisey, where you have the integration between Kubernetes and something that runs on top of Kubernetes, something like that. Those uh, tend to be uh, yeah, uh, uh, kept private, written by some companies such as Microsoft, right? And they don't share it, um, which is a little bit unfortunate. But yeah, usually it pays off to write the specification. Oh, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was good. You showed us some things that uh, you know you hadn't referenced before, so good to get into it. No, I think that answered it. I think. You did sum it up at the beginning, like there's a cost, and right, it's it's all about that value equation we have to think about as we build things. So awesome, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, I think Steve McConnell and Code Complete made the same analogy about if I was going to build a doghouse, I'm not going to sit there and draw blueprints. But if, I, like you were saying, if I'm building a skyscraper, then I'm going to do models, I'm going to do site surveys, I'm going to do a lot to make sure it works right. So yeah. Right. I mean, if it's something there, there is a question in the code. chat too, Marcus. Oh, I don't see. It's, let's see. Seems like many actions in TLA plus are atomic and signaling instantaneous. Can one model processes which interact over a specified duration or range of times and perhaps find race and related conditions? Um, that's a good question. Um, so in TLA plus, an action by itself is, is atomic. Um, but if you want to, for example, model something like message passing, um, you would have a variable that represents your channel, and then you add an element to the channel in one action, and you would have another 
um, action that removes the element from the channel again. And that way you get this uh, non-atomic interactions and also get the model checker to check all possible interleavings. And so that's very well supported. Um, I don't know if you're also interested in real time, sound a little bit like that. Um, Lempo wrote this paper with a catchy type, uh, title. Uh, no, I have to make sure I get this right. Real time is real easy or something like that. Uh, essentially, he shows in the paper how you use TLA plus to check uh, real time systems with time event advancing. Uh, but yeah, okay, we asked real time. So yeah, uh, this paper real time, let's see, Lamport real time, real easy, I believe. Real time model checking is really simple and real time is really simple. Those are the two papers that I would recommend uh, when you're interested in checking real time. Because if you think about it, checking real time properties is actually just uh, checking safety properties because there's a finite and sequence of states before you run into uh, into into a state that violates the real-time guarantees. Um, yeah. Other questions? Let's see if there's more in the chat or check out the papers. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, then uh, let um, me just, yeah, go ahead. All right, I'll ask it since no one else seems to be <laughs> wanting to ask it. If somebody wanted to get started with TLA+, plus, where would you suggest they start? Okay. Again, good question. Oh, where are my slides here? Okay, so uh, the best, the best um, available, freely available course is Lamport's video course um, that he recorded a couple of years ago that is consists of 10 episodes or so or 11 episodes aka.ns slash tla where he really gets started at the beginning what is it what is tla plus about um, every episode is perhaps half an hour 20 minutes to half an hour um, but don't be discouraged if it takes you three hours to watch one episode um, it's dense it's dense material you can also uh, go to GitHub, find my, my material here um, at akm.ms slash TLABQ, TLA blocking queue. They can retrace uh, uh, today's tutorial here. And there is more in there, the stuff about the proof um, that I haven't really shown you. You can probably just skip over it. Um, there is uh, there's stuff about uh, how to relate the implementation, how to check that the implementation conforms to the implementation. Um, and there is also stuff in there, um, which is actually my, my homework assignment for you guys. Um, and if you want to want a homework assignment, let's see where's the history. Um, no, uh, code. Oh, I think I have to click here. So, this was kind of working backwards, right? We had a specification, sorry, we had an implementation from which we derived the specification and then found uh, two bugs, starvation, liveness issue, and a deadlock, um, a safety issue. Now let's say while we're at it, right? Now we finally touched this code base. So let's now add this feature that has been missing uh, forever, which is um, graceful termination. So how do you, gracefully terminate this system where you have an arbitrary number of producers, arbitrary number of consumers, and you want to stop all of them with an empty buffer. So you don't want to kill them. You don't want to lose data in the buffer. And you want to make sure that this all works. So this is now kind of forward uh, designing a new feature. Um, the solution is in the repository um, I don't want you as homework assignment to specify the TLA plus, but try and sit down and on a piece of paper or Word document, try and specify the algorithm um, 
in prose, right? It doesn't have to be formal math. It doesn't have to be TLA plus that you think would make sure that this requirement works. And because this is probably the best way to learn TLA plus to, to get used to this formal thinking. And then once you, you're done with your solution, compare it to mine. Um, and it's surprising because there are many answers to this question on the internet. And there are quite a few that are actually incorrect, even on Stack Overflow and, and paid uh, sites where you would expect some level of quality. Other questions? Oh yeah, I know. Also, we'll be back in a second. <clears throat> There are, there are two books that you can buy, the, which uh, this one you get for free even as the uh, online electronic version, Specifying Systems by Leslie Lamport himself. Uh, that's kind of the canonical book on TLA plus with advanced features. This one is more hands-on practical TLA plus. It's mostly the, the, the Pascal dialect that sits on top of TLA plus, which has uh, extra syntactic sugar um, that make, makes TLA plus look more like an imperative programming language. And it comes with lot, lots of exercises. So this one is also nice. If uh, anyone else has any questions, feel free. I guess no one else has here. any questions right now or they're too shy to say something. Okay, well, uh, then I will say thank you so much for your time, Marcus. I really appreciate it. Yep, it was fun. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Really appreciate you uh, coming out. This was super interesting. And I've got plenty of concurrent systems that uh, I'm interested in testing this out on. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks for having me. Okay, excellent.